Well, thank you. Um, yes, I'm from the Battle Point Astronomical Association. We, uh, this is actually a talk that I gave yeah, last night, which was really convenient, so I only had to make one set of slides. But uh, we have monthly talks that are uh, basically um, just educational. And so they're the second Saturday of the month. And then usually we'll have stargazing afterward. Um, but stargazing around here is always uh, limited on the weather. And last night we got clouded out. So, but anyway, we're just uh, we have the telescope out at Battle Point. It's, we got a 27 and a half inch uh, Newtonian telescope on the roof, and then a planetarium inside. Um, we're a nonprofit, one call for all. So, if, chip in some um, if you if you want to. Uh, anyone can join. You don't need a telescope. And uh, education is our primary goal. We uh, host. Uh, we've got a planetarium inside. We host field trips for. Like all the fifth graders on, on the island come through us, and that's five days of doing two planetarium shows a day. It's, it's quite a production. But anyway, so what we're talking about today is we're talking about exoplanets. And so what I'm going to start off with is a little bit of orbital mechanics, because in order to know what an, how an exoplanet works, you need to understand how things go around stars. And then I'll talk about a little bit about our solar system and the, the first exo exoplanet that was uh, found, um, then sort of like why we look at exoplanets. We want to understand how planets form and, and what, uh, you know, how do we detect that and then how do we detect exoplanets, some science and results, and then we'll look at a gallery full of exoplanets and a, one very special one called Tabby's star. And then a little bit of speculation after that. So orbital mechanics. If you go back to ancient times, the uh, People have been watching the, the planets go around the sun for a long time, and it, after a series of observations, um, Taco Brahe was the first one who came up with a set of instruments where we could get enough detail measurements so that this guy by the name of Kepler um, came up with, the, looked at it, and then plotted them out, and he had some mystical ideas about how this, they were supposed to work, but they um, they didn't, f the p orbits didn't fall into what his mystical ideas were, but he was enough, he, he had enough sense to um, basically say, okay, well, my mystic ideas don't work, and this, but this is how they do work. And he, he came up with his three laws, which are basically taught to every fifth grader. And then Newton took those laws and refined it into universal gravi gravity after uh, some nudging by a few uh, contemporaries, and then Einstein polished it up with uh, general relativity. So that's kind of how orbital mechanics is a little bit of history about it. But if we look at it, this is typically how you think of you know, a planet going around the sun. You have a overwhelmingly massive center star, and then you, you know hypothetically that the star is reacting to this planet, but in reality, you don't really feel like it's moving. So that's kind of how you typically see it. But in reality, what it is is it's an ellipse. And so um, if this was the Earth, um, the Earth reaches its closest point um, in uh, January 4th, I believe it is, and then its furthest point is about July 4th. So we're actually, in summer, we're actually further away from the sun than in, in winter doesn't necessarily seem obvious. Uh, you can also have an ex extended ellipse. This would be typical for like a comet. Um, it's long, spends a lot of time out here, and then speeds up and, and goes by the sun and comes away. Again, mass, one massive body. Um, it turns out that um, a lot of orbits have resonance. There are, there are, um, they, they want to, it's, it's a natural state where an orbit wants to swing back, and it's kind of like a pendulum in a clock. You, you punch it every once in a while, and it actually it needs that, that uh, drive to become stable. And so if you look at the uh, moons of Jupiter, you actually, the moon Ganymede, if, for every one time it goes around, uh, Europa goes around twice, and Io goes around four times. And a lot of times you get things that are tidally locked. So our moon is tidally locked to us, or it's always facing us. Here's Mercury. Mercury goes around twice, uh, goes around uh, three times and spins twice. And so it's uh, tidally locked to the sun. But, uh, so that's some of the things that are kind of weird 
weird things that you wouldn't necessarily see. And we actually see this resonance in, in um, exoplanets too. Here's one exoplanet, Kepler-223. And there's, the, between the different planets that are going around this, this uh, star, these planets are in a, four to, in, in a, in a synchronous orbit uh, rela uh, as you go out. So there's a, th this synchronous orbit, or resonant orbit, is actually beneficial because it stabilizes stabilizes the system. It does, if these were actual, um, if they were not synchronized, they would be unstable. So if we look at um, what you're not used to seeing is things like two stars that are of equal mass. And so if you thought about how they would go around in, in Newton's law, they actually would do something like this, where they, they spin around and they, they, they uh, one of the focus of the ellipses is this center of gravity of the two stars. And they always maintain that, that equal distance between that center, uh, that center point. So that's how um, two stars would orbit uh, each other. Now, the other thing is that we can get weird, some really weird situations. Um, if there's, these are uh, Janus and Epimethus, which are moons of Saturn. Um, this is what, how you look at it, and this moon is actually, Epimethus is actually um, jerked around in its orbit, so orbits can change. Pretty, orbits can change by the influence of other bodies. And so if you looked at it to a, as this goes, it, as this sneaks up on uh, Janus, it, Epimethus gets kicked out of, into a higher orbit, which slows it down, and it trails. And so as a result, in a rotating frame, you're basically holding uh, Janus sta stationary. It does what we call a horseshoe orbit, and it sits here, and it goes like this. It's kind of bizarre. So there are some weird things, and you, you, you can see some weird orbits. Um, but uh, so this is what, what this is a diagrammatic what happens here is that the Janus actually moves back and forth a little bit and then Epimethus gets kicked in and out uh, quite a bit. Now, if you get more than two bodies in a system, um, you get a, it it's becomes what's called the three-body problem and uh, this is not a star system. This is something that you would only see in a circus. This is three bodies that are being juggled it doesn't really happen that way. You don't, you don't see stars that, are, that do this. Um, what happens in a three-body system is that a three-body system is inherently unstable. When you start looking at these things and how they interact together, unless they magically are perfectly aligned and, and perfectly set up, they don't, they're not stable. Um, they want to break apart and um, they'll fly apart in all different directions. It's, and it's very, um, very sensitive. So you've got two setups here. One, this is a uh, synchronous uh, three-body orbit, and this is a non-synchronous three-body orbit. And so if you, um, and the parameters are, are really close together. The only difference is that the uh, eccentricity of these orbits is a little bit different. And so if you, this one starts out, and it actually, this one is actually a stable, um, stable orbit and it'll last a long time. This one, on the other hand, is not a stable orbit. And why is this, that one, uh, so this one expands and eventually it will lose its uh, third member. So it's uh, not stable. And it drives these two apart. Orbital, when you start looking at stars and orbital mechanics, so the, the Tatooine stars are, are, it's rare to see, it's, it's rare to see a, uh, two, two star systems are common and three star systems are common in this scenario where two stars are close together and one star is way out, way far apart. Um, if you see a four star system, it's, it's gonna be a similar, similar setup where you've got uh, the second star um, a paired with another star, so. When you see our, so let's, orbital mechanics of it. Um, however, this is uh, interesting. We see other things that we see is a globular cluster 
and this is a group of about typically about 10,000 stars in this numeric pro numeric simulation it's only a thousand but what it is is that the individual components is insignificant to the total mass of the system and so the the center of gravity of the entire system is someplace in here and things kind of orbit about it but it's, they're influenced by the other other uh, items that are around it and so you this is this is a uh, not really germane to the talk but it's it's kind of a neat uh, neat effect that you see with uh, with uh, globular clusters and globular clusters are extremely stable they're some of the oldest stars they're the some of the oldest stars in our galaxy and there are about 170 of uh, 170 or so globular clusters out there that are about uh, 100,000 stars each so but anyway, so a little bit on, on how, how the mechanics of uh, how, how stars go around, how planets go around their stars. So anyway, so, so if we look at our solar system, we've been looking at it for a long time and we kind of thought we understood it. It was, it was um, you know, we came up with sort of this hand waving model where you get the secretion disk and things coalesce in it and you get nodules and, and planets start forming and all these planets kind of sit in the same plane and they all kind of go around in the same way and they all spin in the more or less the same direction. There are some outliers that you can wave away like uh, Uranus is tilted 90 degrees and you can say that okay it got whacked a little bit and we kind of, kind of un understood it. We kind of came up with this argument of how the how their planet forms and the ones that are close in are rocky because the the sun as it coalesced it blows all the material out and so we sort of said okay well that's how we think it happens and we've got lots of lots of stars out there and so we've got this great great uh, statistical problem and we have a sample of one and so that's how things work and so we kind of thought we understood it and that was before 1995 because that was when we first found our first exoplanet and 51 peg is our first exoplanet and it turns out that it's a planet the size of Jupiter but it's sitting inside the orbit of Mercury it's um, its period is 4.2 days and a star that's roughly the same size as our Sun it's an extremely hot planet and so it's a uh, it sits here and it goes, it uh, orbits um, its star every four days. It's really quite high, quite fast, quite in, inside and hot. And so we had to rethink that. And our con concept of how planets form just didn't work. So when we look at planets, how planets form, it really has to satisfy a whole bunch of things. Well, three things. It's got a match up our, our solar system. Our solar system is a result of planets forming. Uh, it needs to look at protoplanet disks because we see these disks out there in places like the Orion, uh, Orion Nebula and the Lagoon Nebula where you can actually see planets forming. Exoplanets also needed to uh, fit into this because get, getting a statistical sample of how the various exoplanets work will give us a better understanding of how planets form and make a better um, theoretical model of, of the, the formation. So we start with a set of initial conditions. Basically, you've got a dust cloud and that coalesces and, and you end up getting little things and you, you end up getting nodules in it and these nodules form into protoplanets and then a set of planets. And this, this is kind of the way we thought of, of our galaxy forming. But so we, we need to constrain that through observations and, uh, and look at the end states and figure out what's going on. So the, the, basically the idea is that you've got a collapse of a molecular cloud and it collapses under its own um, gravitation it, and it fragments into little nodules and these little nodules are going to conserve the angular momentum that they have and as they increase rotation they, they get hot and they, they, they coalesce and they form what's called an accretion disk and all this disk is, is, is in dust and gas and that's generally the idea of how we formed our, our solar system and it kind of applies to the exoplanets too. The question becomes how do these exoplanets get distributed and things like that. So when we look at these uh, stars, we look at 
um, we look, observe them, and we observe them in, in different, um, different radiations. The great thing about um, every, everything is that everything glows. When you go to the doctor's office, you glow, and the doctor measures your luminosity from looking in your ear. He sticks, your, sticks, your, uh, sticks a thermometer in your ear, and that is actually a little, little camera, and it's what it's doing is it's measuring this way. This is a, your temperature is about 300 degrees Kelvin, plus or minus a little bit depending on what you're feeling like. And so what they do is they stick that thermometer in your ear and measure how bright you are. And if you're really bright, it means you're sick. And so they, they can tell that by measuring the infrared, infrared light that's coming off of you. Well, if you look at our sun, our sun actually peaks is the, the shallow curve and it peaks here. And you can tell how bright a star is, how hot it is by this, by looking at the different levels of radiation over, over its, in different frequencies. And that gives you an idea of how hot things are. And from that, you can look at it like a molecular cloud and you can see stars uh, forming. And starting with a blob of, out of the parent cloud, you can map how hot it is and how hot it is inside, inside its core and as you go out. And then you can observe the, the dust and the uh, accretion disk as it's forming. And then once when a star forms, you get this um, characteristic um, um, radiation from a star and then these other blobs that sit on top of it and as, as, it, as you go through time, so these are, this also has time here, so the, the you, zero to uh, 30,000 years to, uh, to uh, 200,000 years to, to 3 million years and, and uh, 10, 10 million years you're out here. So as, as, you, as you go through time, this is kind of the, the model of how the stars form. And so we look at different areas like in the Orion Nebula, and you can actually pick out stars within the Orion Nebula where you can see these disks forming. And these are little, little stars that are actually starting to form little planets. And so it's pretty common in, in, a, in a disk. So you actually sit there and you measure the, the heat coming from a individual, the, the core star, and then as you go out, these regions get hotter and colder, and you measure the, the components, and you see these transition, this tra transition as, as the planets will form in these regions. And here's one called PDS-70. This is just recently released. Um, so this is a protoplanetary disk where they've measured, uh, they've actually observed the planets. This is the first time they've actually observed uh, by direct imaging a planet inside this accretion disk. And so in here you've got this um, invisible light and it's called H alpha, is this planet and then this disk in here which is in infrared, it's, it's, it's cooler than the planet. And then this is the direct image, this is uh, the direct image of the planet. They null out the star because it's, it would uh, overwhelm the, the image. But uh, that's May of this year. So it's kind of really neat. Some of the stuff, the, the, um, the Hubble and other, other things, the um, Spitzer are doing. So, so how do we detect exoplanets? We can see the star's light shift. This is the Doppler effect. As it gets, as it moves, oh, towards us and away from us, it'll shift its frequency of light just like a siren on a, on a fire truck as it goes in, and, as it comes in close and it goes away. That's one way to detect it. We can see them wobble. If you look at a star up in the sky, you can see it wobble as the planet goes around it. It's actually it's true with Jupiter. You can, Jupiter, the center of, of mass between uh, Jupiter and the sun is actually outside the surface of the sun. So in the 12 years it takes Jupiter to go around it, you could actually see the sun wobble if you were looking at it from someplace else. You can see, you can actually take pictures of them. This is called direct imaging. It's very difficult. You have to pull the starlight out of it because the starlight over, generally overwhelms it. You can see pa planets passed in front of them. This is called transit. If you've heard of Kepler, this is how Kepler works, is that they pick, pick it off in transit. You can infer planets being there. Uh, this is sort of like Jan uh, Janus and Epimethus. Epimethus. Um, you can infer a planet. If you consider 
a Janus and Epimethus going around a sun instead of Saturn, you would infer that the, their uh, behavior by, by looking at how they, they would transit that. Um, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that you can see gravitational lensing occasionally. This is actually a very rare occurrence, but uh, this works uh, at, at great distances. You can infer planets from seeing them with gravitational lensing. The probability of that actually happening and seeing is pretty rare, so there are very few that we actually have that do that. So how do we detect exoplanets using radial velocity? It's basically, it depends on the geometry of it, but it'll work for, um, it works for large, plan large planets, but it's, it depends on the plane, uh, and if the, if the planes line up with um, the Earth, then we can see it pretty well. If it's, if it's uh, perpendicular to the Earth, you, it could go around in this plane all the time, and you wouldn't be able to, if the Earth is over here, you wouldn't be able to see any, any uh, deviation at all. So it's all fu a function of the angle uh, that uh, we, that uh, the, pl the angle of the plane of rotation of the uh, exoplanet. It's limited to the sensitivity of the spectrograph. So the idea is that when, as the, plan as the planet goes around the star, it moves the star so much, and we can actually watch those shift, the spectral lines shift. Each, uh, each element that's in a planet takes a little bit of light out of a specific point, and the different classes of stars show different spectral lines. And we sit there and we see how much they move. And so there's, this is a little chart of how a large planet would influence um, the star motion at, at different ranges. So one AU is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so, and five AU is the distance between the, the Sun and Jupiter. So that gives you an idea of how, it, you know, it works, you know, you can get some decent changes in velocity for large planets, but for something, a planet like Earth, it just, it, you're not going to detect uh, an Earth planet with that. And it takes, so here's uh, some examples. This is, uh, you, know, you, you watch the planets move, and, and this is uh, plotting out that data, and you look at these expected orbits, and they look very similar, and that's actually, if you look at the center of mass, that's here and here, but the x-axis here is, this is the movement of the star, it's one part, in a thousand movement of the of the planet, so that gives you an idea of what of how that's done. It's and it takes a lot of uh, a lot of equipment to measure this because you're looking at uh, change in one meter is a change in wavelength of that's a really small number. That's let it's on the order it's uh, that's uh, ten thousandth of an angstrom. It's really a, a really small wavelength and. Uh, it's, you got to be very careful on how you do your measurement. It's uh, very sensitive to temperature and, and pressure and, and everything else. So it's a, it's a very difficult measure to get. So another way to do it is measuring the wobble. It, these are, again, difficult. It, they tend to work better with large planets. And if you can do it, uh, you make patterns of how these guys wobble around and, and work around a center, center point. And this is, this is how it would look for the sun, um, for looking at it far away. Um, we've gotten a few planets with this technique. Uh, recently, with, uh, there's, a, there's a space probe out there called GIA, Gia, which was um, basically to do precise astronometry of stars, to fix distance to stars. And it, um, it, it found a few of these. It's, um, it does a, it was, sole purpose was to, well its primary purpose was to measure distance to stars using parallax and it, um, it uh, was doubled up as, as measuring some exoplanets. So it, again, uh, we can use direct imaging, that's taking pictures of the stars. The problem is, is that it needs huge telescopes and adaptive optics to pull out the fluctuations of the atmosphere and you end up getting little, little planets like that, and it's, it's, it's starting to work better for, with some of the bigger, new bigger telescopes, but it's still very difficult. But transit is the, is the, uh, is the uh, method that gets most of our results. And transit involves basically the, the um, planet, the exoplanet coming in and passing in front of the star, 
And if you look at something like a, a, the Earth, Sun, it has a very low, one in 200 chance of actually passing in front for, any con, for a nominal configuration. So for every, every one we get, there's 200 out there that we missed. So it's, it has uh, predictable biases for large, close in, large, larger planets and close in planets. So if you looked at how they go, how the um, light curve changes, it's going, the light curve is going to be longer for, for bigger stars and deeper for bigger planets. And so that gives you an idea of the geometry of the situation. As, and then you've, you can look at the different wavelengths of light and infer um, different, ma different materials in the uh, planet by looking at how, this, how these light curves change in different frequencies of light. You can track some of the di dynamics of the situation by precisely watching how this light curve works and which way things are spinning. Um, there are some chances for false positive and you have to make sure that those aren't biting you, but that's, uh, um, that's things you gotta look at. Other techniques, uh, transit timing, this is, uh, works for uh, uh, transit planets where you see perturbations, uh, changes in the timing between um, uh, light drops. So this is a diagram where the planet comes in and passes in front of it each time. And it's, this is what you'd expect, is that you get a consistent uh, timing between, uh, between the two of them. However, if you get uh, two planets going around, which is the next one, and the second planet's not visible, you can see small changes in how the, the, it affects the timing because the second planet will want to pull that one planet a little bit. And because of that, you can infer that there's another planet in there. And so by doing that, they, for this one system, Kepler-16b, they've inferred that there's one planet that goes around every 8.8 8 .8 days and another planet that goes around every 24 days. In a, another technique, uh, gravitational microlensing, um, in this case, they've got a, a, two stars that pretty much line up, and the star behind, it's the star from behind, its light deviates, is deviated by the star that's close in. And when that happens, it will, the light from this source star will um, be, will be impinged by the, the exoplanet, and it will uh, get in its way, and you see a, a dimp uh, from that. The actual, um, Experiment is designed to detect dark matter, but it's uh, also picked up a few exoplanets, that, and these tend to be very far away on the other side of, in, uh, in comparison to the more local ones. But Kepler is the big winner here. Kepler, the Kepler mission um, is uh, named after the guy who originally came up with, the, with figured out the orbits, uh, orbital mechanics. Um, but it's a it's a satellite that's basically pointed at a single was pointed at a single space in, in the sky, and if you go out in the middle of the night these days, you'll see the Summer Triangle, which is the star Deneb, Vega, and Altair, and Ve Vega is pretty much straight overhead. So this is in between Vega and Deneb, and it's this section right here where it just literally from 2009 to about 2014, it just pointed at that one spot in, spot in the sky and took pictures every 30 minutes. And so from that, they, could, they looked at a lot of, uh, I think it was 150,000 stars, and uh, it was just pointed in this one spot in the galaxy. And that weren't, went on for until about 2004. Unfortunately, things break. Um, there's, uh, some, there's a device in a lot of satellites called a reaction wheel, and basically what it is is a gyroscope. And gyroscopes, they're mechanical, and they broke. We, we, they went up with four, two of them broke, and when two of them broke, it can no longer be uh, stabilized on its uh, supposed field of view. So what they did was they did the first space, it became the first space sailing mission. They used the shape of the spacecraft to stabilize it in one axis and use the other two reaction wheels 
to uh, point it and, and to control its pointing. And as a result, it, as it went around the sun over the course of the year, it would point in different directions and it could stabilize itself in that direction for a period of time. And they came up with some, they found some more exoplanets in, in this K2 mission. So, so how many exoplanets have we, exocoupler discovered? It's picked up 20, uh, 2,300 about. And then in K2, the K2 mission, it's picked up another uh, confirmed 325. And this is, that's the original field of view from Vega to Deneb right there. So the next, next uh, one that's going up is uh, TESS. And uh, TESS stands for uh, trans, transis, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It is, went up uh, in April of this year or May, May this year, of this year. And it is, um, it's going, instead of, Kepler was had an orbit around the sun very, that paralleled the Earth very closely. And it, that isolated it from the Earth so it wasn't uh, affected by the Earth too much. But uh, TESS is a little bit more um, on, a, on the cheap. And it's actually in a synchronous orbit with uh, the moon. And this is what this colorful mess is try, trying to show, how the orbit of, uh, of the Earth and the moon and then TESS sits here and is in a two to one uh, uh, orbit with it. But I've got a, a movie that describes it a little bit better. Our Milky Way galaxy is strewn with billions of planets, alien worlds still unseen by human eyes, at least for now. Only three decades ago, we didn't know if there were planets beyond our own solar system. In 1995, astronomers discovered that a star in the constellation Pegasus was wobbling back and forth, tugged by the gravity of an unseen planet, an exoplanet, a hot and hellish world unfit for life as we know it. The wobble method of planet hunting relies on sensitive spectroscopes. As an orbiting planet tugs on its star, the starlight we see shifts from blue to red and back again. The Kepler Space Telescope was launched in 2009. It found thousands of exoplanets by staring at a small patch of the Milky Way. Kepler didn't look for wobbles. It looked for small dips in starlight when a planet crosses in front of its star. Kepler found systems of planets, groups of worlds swirling around their star, lonely planets encased in ice, other worlds scorched by fire, newborn planets shrouded in dust, water worlds, and planets swept by global storms. Planets dancing in orbit with two stars or even three, and even planets from other galaxies that were swallowed up by the Milky Way. In recent years, astronomers have taken the first direct images of exoplanets, blurry pixels of alien landscapes. We've discovered a free-floating planet, not bound to any star, and we've seen signs of planets being born infant worlds scoring dark rings in the dust around their stars. Now a new planet hunter will join the search. On April 16, 2018, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, will lift off from Cape Canaveral. TESS will spend two years scrutinizing the entire sky watching nearby stars for minute dips in brightness caused by a nearby alien world. TESS's four cameras cover a swath of sky 96 degrees tall. TESS will divide the sky into sections like the slices of orange and stare at each section for 27 days, then move on to the next. After two years, we will have covered the whole sky. TESS will fly an unusual orbit, swooping as far out as the moon every two weeks before falling back close to Earth and dumping a torrent of data to eager astronomers. 
chess is a target hunter. The planets it finds can be studied by the next generation of telescopes on Earth and in space. With luck, Tess will discover worlds suitable for lakes and oceans with rich atmospheres and chemical signals we can detect. Their gases could tell us whether these planets are habitable or inhabited by the likes of us. The Milky Way holds more planets than stars, and the diversity that we still haven't begun to find. In the search for life and meaning in the cosmos, our own world is still the gold standard. Okay. So, of the uh, sort of the convention is is when you don't really know what you're doing in science, is you take everything and you organize it. <laughs> so we're trying. What we're trying to do now is we're trying to um, get a statistical sample of what what things are going to look like and get uh, get things understand how things work. Um, we, we have a, we find lots of giant planets, and that's more of an artifact of our techniques. And and then we we're seeing other other things that are um, other planets of other size. The ones that we really are that are sometimes what are thought to be more interesting are these potentially habitable ones, the uh, the, the ones in the warm uh, zone. What's um, you see very few of these uh, uh, small small planets. They're very difficult to find. And you wouldn't expect to find too many really cold, uh, small planets because the, the cold ones seem to be close in. At least that's our current con current thought. But just sort of uh, gives you an idea of how many we're discovering the, you know, the these hot Jupiters and hot uh, Newtonian Neptunians and and super Earths. These are these tend to be the 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 ones that most of them. Most of them are, and that that may be more that we're biased towards uh, small orbits. Kepler is looking at at, at we're looking at things that um, uh, are very short, typically very short orbits, and so that tends to bias the data. So, but we always want to talk about the habitable ones. It's sort of a, um, finding things like Kepler 186f, which is in what we refer to. Uh, euphemistically as the Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. Um, that, ch that will shift star to star. Bigger stars have a bigger Goldilocks zone. It's a function of, of its intensity, but it's um, further out. And as you get smaller stars, they're smaller, but these stars, you know, they're, uh, it's closer in. Now, the interesting thing with stars is that these uh, stars are a lot like rock stars. The big stars live hard, die young. Small stars, they are very conservative. They, uh, they, they very frugal with their, their energy. And they, these big stars live at 20 million years. Our star will live about 10 million years. These little tiny stars, they'll live a trillion years. There's a couple of other things that make them live a lot longer than other stars. Uh, they're, but they're, the uh, interesting part about them is they're also a little bit more volatile. They're, uh, they're not as stable as uh, some of the bigger stars. But uh, if you could come up with a, a little bit smaller star, it could live for a few hundred billion years. Imagine the uh, civilization that would uh, develop in that. So when we look at these, we habitable, potentially habitable ha uh, planets, uh, the They've come up with these, this Earth similarity index, and they kind of look at the Earth as one, and then look at the others, other ones that have a, a fairly high number. Um, Mars is 0.64, so anything higher than 0.64 is you know, something that might be considered. Uh, turns out that Proxima Centauri b is the highest on this list, and Proxima Centauri b is the closest one. It, uh, it's it's uh, part of the Alpha Centauri system, and that's the closest star. Um, there, and there's some other ones, the Trappist 1e, and, and you know, there's a slew of them. Um, and if you look at where the Goldilocks zone is and the the planets that are in it, there's uh, these are a slew of them. They tend to be 
We, we found them in the, the, these stars that are cooler. Here's the Earth, and uh, here's Mars's right there. So it's this, um, there are a few of them. They tend to be in smaller stars. They, this, in the larger stars, it seems to be overwhelmed by the Jovian, Jovian planets. But, uh, so, but if you look at uh, where we find the exoplanets is, is a distance from Earth. So we're finding them a lot, most of them, the lion's share is or find, found close to Earth. Not surprising. Uh, our sensitivity is, is much better in this region. Uh, this is within, um, this is in parsecs, but this is about, uh, parsec is about 3.28 light years. And so the, these first three bars are about 100 light years with, within the Earth. So it's real, real close to us. And then the, you know, so they're spread out, but most of them are really, most of the ones we see are really close. And then you extend this population over the, uh, over the galaxy. Um, sort of, uh, so we've got size versus orbital period. Um, we look at the rocky planets and then the cold jack giants. So the, the uh, we look at different styles of different types of planets. Uh, things in closer are called lava worlds and they're uh, different, we're plotting things up and, it's, and it's trying to figure, trying to get enough statistics to make some meaning out of what's going on. Number of planets per hundred stars. So it's, this is a what we've noted in the data so far, what's what's kind of odd is this this dip. Why would you see this dip here? Do we is that a real, a real artifact or is it just we don't have enough data yet? So and then there's this is the exoplanet discovery rate. These two large purple um, spikes are where Ke there was a massive dump of Kepler data, and that's where uh, we, Kepler is now out of fuel and we're not going to get any more Kepler data, but Hopefully, we test has just got, gone online for science, and hopefully, we'll start seeing some more uh, with tests in the next few years. So, currently, mm -hmm. with Kepler and all the other sources, we currently have 3,800 exoplanets and about 600 plus multi-planet systems, and a couple, 20, about 2,400 candidates. Uh, so. Lots of them, some of these uh, are uh, some of the statistics about uh, what we're seeing. Uh, sort of semi-conclusions that you can, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, with the, col the data collection of science uh, that we uh, see. And uh, so the other question is how do you, when we look at these exoplanets, you know, you keep on hearing about, you know, this one has water and this one, this one has, is made out of iron or whatever. How, how do we detect that? So what, we, what we're looking at is we're looking at eclipsing exoplanets. And when you're in this primary eclipse phase, if the exoplanet has an atmosphere, the light will scatter it and you can look at the different components in this different, different wavelengths of light and pick out different, um, different characteristics of it. And that's how they're detecting the, um, the, you know, they're looking for water. That's how they detect the water and things like that. It's a very, um, I wouldn't call it a, uh, a completely authoritative method, but that's, that's the best they've got. Um, so they're, they're, they're looking at that and trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and then there's amateur detection. There's a lot of amateurs out there like me. This is a very similar, this guy has a, a friend of mine, Ken Hose, in or, at uh, Oregon. He's, um, he's got a very similar setup to what I have at my home. And he's sitting there and he's picking off exoplanets in his backyard. So it's um, eclipsing exoplanets. These are not new, but he's confirming uh, exoplanets from other sources. So it's kind of fun. Fun thing. So, here are a few exoplanets that are that are out there that we've discovered so far. Um, these are all Kepler 35, Kepler 16b, and HD 18873 uh, are are planets that are orbiting multi-star systems. So this is like Tatooine. Um, so that's a, a few of them. There's uh, planets. There's a, a 
an M-class star, a very cool star where we found uh, seven planets on. And one, one of those planets is, actually it's, uh, F, it's F, so I believe it's this guy. B, C, D, E, F, yep, that guy. And we, we believe that we've detected water on it, meaning possibly oceans. Um, so, it's in, and it's in the Goldilocks zone, so this is, when you see an artist's rendition like this, uh, take it with a grain of salt. It's a, a lot of license in it. So, we've seen systems, Kepler-90 has eight planets, just like our system. The uh, sizes are, are uh, can be measured reasonably well, but the sizes line up pretty well with our own solar system. This is kind of interesting. Um, this is a very hot Jupiter. It actually is bleeding off atmosphere. It's kind of like, like a permanent comet that's orbiting its sun. It's very close in. Its orbiting, orbital period is 1.3 days. It's really hot. This the next one is, is so hot, it's next to a, an A-type star, which is a very hot star. And its surface temperature is about the surface temperature of our sun. So it is, there's like no chemistry on this star. It's all ionized um, material. And you just don't build bonds. And it's, it's, uh, it's thought to be mostly iron because anything else would get blown off by, uh, would vaporize and get blown off by, this, by the, uh, the intense glow of this, this uh, star, which is about 7,800 degrees hot, surface temperature of it. So it's really a, a hellish, system, hellish place. Uh, and this one was uh, discovered by the um, uh, gravitational lens, lens me me mechanism. It's a very faint star that's all far, um, far, far away. And its surface temperature is, is, it appears to be about minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 150 Kelvin or minus about 200 degrees centi uh, centigrade. Really, really cold. Um, it's the coldest planet they found. Um, yeah, it's a cold world, so you go hot, cold. And this is a very close exoplanet. It's the um, 11 light years away. It's on the star Ross 128. And uh, it's, the, it's the closest one after Proxima B. A lot of the systems we find are compact. There are a lot of planets that are tight and close. Now, that, that, a lot of that may be there's a skew in the data because those are easy to detect, and, um, but we're seeing a lot of them. As the planets get further away from the sun, they're more difficult to detect. Okay, so we've got Kepler-186f. That was the, the one that I showed in the Goldilocks picture. That's in the habitable zone. Nice possible of Earth. Uh, this is a very old star. This is a, an 11.2 billion years old, uh, Kepler 444. Uh, it's a very old star. Um, we can tell how old it is by looking at how much iron is in the atmosphere of the star compared to hydrogen. That's kind of our benchmark. And this is the estimate, 11.2 billion years old. And it's still got uh, planets around it. And they're small planets. And then there's very young stars like this one. This one is, this star is only about 16 million years old, but it has large planets around it. So it's, as, as time has progressed, we've taken more of the, the universe has taken more of the hydrogen and helium and converted it into heavier elements, and we're getting more planets from that. Um, then this is an interesting planet. This is one of the, uh, actually the, the, this was the, uh, Technically, the first one found because uh, PEG 51b was found by um, in, op in the optical wavelengths. And this this one was actually found in X uh, in I think it was in radio wavelengths. This is a planet that's orbiting a pulsar. So a pulsar is a leftover remnant of a supernova. So this planet went through a supernova and it's still there. It get, a supernova is just an intense explosion when a, a star about eight times more massive than the sun gets, just blows itself apart. And uh, it's, the planet's still there. And who knows what happened to it. I would have expected it to uh, get blown away, but it's still there. Uh, let's see. 
So this is K2. So this is in the second half, second Kepler mission. Um, it has so it's it's so it's just uh, bright enough where they can look at it and determine the atmospheres. Um, then some loose ends. We've uh, found a rogue planet or two. Uh, these are planets that have been kicked out of star systems. Uh, okay, so indirect methods. Estimated total population of stars uh, in the galaxy. So we've estimated the total population is about the same number as the population of the galaxy. And then there's this thing. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And it is my job, my responsibility as an astronomer to remind people that alien hypotheses should always be a last resort. Now, I want to tell you a story about that. It involves data from a NASA mission, ordinary people, and one of the most extraordinary stars in our galaxy. We began in 2009 with the launch of NASA's Kepler mission. Kepler's main scientific objective was to find planets outside of our solar system. It did this by staring at a single field in the sky, this one with all the tiny boxes. And in this one field, it monitored the brightness of over 150,000 stars continuously for four years, taking a data point every 30 minutes. It was looking for what astronomers call a transit. This is when the planet's orbit is aligned in our line of sight, just so that the planet crosses in front of a star. And when this happens, it blocks out a tiny bit of starlight, which you can see as a dip in this curve. And so the team at NASA had developed very sophisticated computers to search for transits in all the Kepler data. At the same time of the first data release, Astronomers at Yale were wondering an interesting thing. What if computers miss something? And so we launched a citizen science project called Planet Hunters to have people look at the same data. The human brain has an amazing ability for pattern recognition, sometimes even better than a computer. However, there was a lot of skepticism around this. My colleague, Deborah Fisher, founder of the Planet Hunters project, so the people at the time were saying, you're crazy. There's no way that a computer will miss a signal. And so it was on, the classic human versus machine gamble. And if we found one planet, we would be thrilled. When I joined the team four years ago, we had already found a couple. And today, with the help of over 300,000 science enthusiasts, we have found dozens. And we've also found one of the most mysterious stars in our galaxy. So to understand this, let me show you what a normal transit in Kepler data looks like. On this graph, on the left-hand side, you have the amount of light, and on the bottom is time. The white line is the light just from the star, what astronomers call a light curve. Now, when a planet transits a star, it blocks out a bit, little bit of this light, and the depth of this transit reflects the size of the object itself. <clears throat> and so, for example, let's take Jupiter. Planets don't get much bigger than Jupiter. Jupiter will make a 1% drop in a star's brightness. Earth, on the other hand, is 11 times smaller than Jupiter, and signal is barely visible in the data. So back to our mystery. A few years ago, planet hunters were sifting through data looking for transits, and they spotted a mysterious signal coming from the star KIC 8462852. The observations in May of 2009 were the first they spotted, and they started talking about this in the discussion forums. They said, an object like Jupiter will make a drop like this in the star's light, but they were also saying it was giant. You see, transits normally only last for a few hours, and this one lasted for almost a week. They were also saying that it looks asymmetric, meaning that instead of the clean U-shaped dip that we saw with Jupiter, it had this strange slope that you can see on the left side. This seemed to indicate 
that whatever is getting in the way and blocking the starlight was not circular like a planet. There are a few more dips that happened, but for a couple of years, it was pretty quiet. And then in March of 2011, we see this. The star's light drops by a whole 15%. And this is huge compared to a planet, which would only make a 1% drop. We describe this feature as both smooth and clean. It also is asymmetric, having a gradual dimming that lasts almost a week, and then it snaps right back up to normal in just a matter of days. And again, after this, not much happens. Until February of 2013, things start to get really crazy. There is a huge complex of dips in the light curve that appear, and they last for like 100 days, all the way up into the Kepler mission's end. These dips have variable shapes. Some are very sharp and some are broad, and they also have variable durations. Some last just for a day or two and some for more than a week. And there's also up and down trends within some of these dips, almost like several independent events were superimposed on top of each other. And at this time, this star drops in its brightness over 20%. This means that whatever is blocking its light has an area of over a thousand times the area of our planet Earth. This is truly remarkable. And so the citizen scientists, when they saw this, they notified the science team that they found something weird enough that it might be worth following up. And so when the science team looked at it, we're like, yeah, there's, there's probably just something wrong with the data. But we looked really, really, really hard. And the data were good. And so what was happening had to be astrophysical, meaning that something in space was getting in the way and blocking starlight. And so at this point, we set out to learn everything we could about the star to see if we can find any clues to what was going on. And the citizen scientists who helped us in this discovery, they joined along for the ride, watching science in action firsthand. First, somebody said, well, you know, what if this star was actually very young and it still had the cloud of material it was born from surrounding it? And then somebody else said, well, what if the star had already formed planets and two of these planets had collided, similar to the Earth-Moon forming event? Well, both of these theories could explain part of the data, but the difficulties were that the star showed no signs of being young, and there was no glow from any of the material that was heated up by the star's light. And you would expect this if the star was young or if there was a collision and a lot of dust was produced. And so somebody else said, well, how about a huge swarm of comets that are passing by the star in a very elliptical orbit? Well, it ends up that this is actually consistent with our observations. But I agree, it does feel a little contrived. You see, it would take hundreds of comets to reproduce what we're observing. And these are only the comets that happen to pass between us and the star. And so, in reality, we're talking thousands to tens of thousands of comets. But of all the bad ideas we had, this one was the best. And so we went ahead and published our findings. Now let me tell you, this was one of the hardest papers I ever wrote. Scientists are meant to publish results, and this situation was far from that. And so we decided to give it a catchy title, and we called it Where's the Flux? I will let you work out the acronym. <laughs> story. Around the same time I was writing this paper, I met with a colleague of mine, Jason Wright, and he was also writing a paper on Kepler data. And he was saying that with Kepler's extreme precision, it could actually detect alien megastructures around stars. But it didn't. And then I showed him this weird data that our citizen scientists had found, and he said to me, oh crap, Tabby, now I have to rewrite my paper. So yes, the natural explanations were weak. Um, and we were curious now, so we had to find a way to rule out aliens. So together, we convinced a colleague of ours who works on SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, that this would be an extraordinary target to pursue. 
We wrote a proposal to observe the star with the world's largest radio telescope at the Green Bank Observatory. A couple of months later, news of this proposal got leaked to the press. <laughs> And now there are thousands of articles, over 10,000 articles, on this star alone. And if you search Google Images, this is what you'll find. Now you may be wondering, okay, Tabby, well, how do aliens actually explain this light curve? Okay, well, imagine a civilization that's much more advanced than our own. In this hypothetical circumstance, the civilization would have exhausted the energy supply of their home planet. So where could they get more energy? Well, they have a host star, just like we have a sun. And so if they were able to capture more energy from this star, then that would solve their energy needs. So they would go and build huge structures. These giant megastructures, like ginormous solar panels, are called Dyson spheres. Now this image above are lots of artist impressions of Dyson spheres. It's really hard to provide perspective on the vastness of these things. But you can think of it this way. The Earth-Moon distance is a quarter of a million miles. The simplest element on one of these structures is a hundred times that size. They're enormous. And now imagine one of these structures in motion around a star. You can see how it produced anomalies in the data, such as uneven, unnatural-looking dips. But it remains that even alien megastructures cannot defy the laws of physics. You see, anything that uses a lot of energy is going to produce heat. And we don't observe this. But it could be something as simple as they're just re-rating it away in another direction, just not at Earth. Another idea that's one of my personal favorites is that we just witnessed an interplanetary space battle and the <laughs> catastrophic destruction of a planet. Now I admit that this will produce a lot of dust that we don't observe, but if we're already invoking aliens in this explanation, then who's to say they didn't efficiently clean up all this mess for recycling purposes? You can see how this quickly captures your imagination. Well, there you have it. We're in a situation that could unfold to be a natural phenomenon we don't understand or an alien technology we don't understand. Personally, as a scientist, my money is on the natural explanation. But don't get me wrong, I do think it would be awesome to find aliens. Either way, there is something new and really interesting to discover. So what happens next? We need to continue to observe the star to learn out more what's happening. But professional astronomers, like me, we have limited resources for this kind of thing. And Kepler is on to a different mission. And I'm happy to say that, once again, citizen scientists have come in and saved the day. You see, <clears throat> this time, amateur astronomers with their backyard telescopes stepped up immediately and started observing the star nightly at their own facilities. And I am so excited to see what they found. What's amazing to me is that this star would have never been found by computers because we just weren't looking for something like this. And what's more exciting is that there's more data to come. There are new missions that are coming up that are observing millions of more stars all over the sky. And just think, what will it mean when we find another star like this? And what will it mean if we don't find another star like this? Thank you. If you actually go searching for Tabby Star on the on the web, you'll get all sorts of um, deep state alien hypotheses, crackpots um, speculating their own. Uh, I saw one where they were actually someone guy actually made predictions about this this the this transit should occur here and it should be this deep, and it didn't happen. And he's going, the astronomers were all wrong. So anyway, it was, it's it's its own. 
uh, soap opera. It's kind of like the Trump White House all by itself. <laughs> so anyway, so this is the Drake equation, which is always uh, uh, interesting. This is a concept where you look at a couple of factors in the, in the galaxy and you try and figure out how many uh, civilizations uh, there are intelligent uh, civilizations and uh, that's defined as radio communications. And that's the talk. So that's all I've got. Let's have a questions. Okay. Any questions or yeah. Could you get a uh, transiting, a false transiting effect if there was a black hole or something in front of a star? Um you would probably you'd get gravitational lensing around it and um, you would probably be a lot deeper and um, there'd be a lot it would not be it would it would be vastly different it would be something it would look a lot different around it yeah so it would be it would be noticeable it would it would sh it would shoot alarm bells off and stuff like that so yeah the question of the questions or When you talked about uh, early on the, the habitable uh, planets, mm -hmm. was that, is that based on Drake's equation? No, it's based, basically on thermodynamics. Um, it's how bright is the star, how much heat is it giving off. Um, if it's too close from that, it's going to burn, it's going to basically blow off anything that's volatile. If it's far away, too far away, it's, it, things will get too cold. And so it's just a matter of simple thermodynamics, seeing how, how close it needs to be. Yeah. You said the nearest one was in uh, Centauri system, which Proxima B, yeah. Yeah, which which we could travel to in a single human lifetime, right? Well, it's three point two eight light years away, or no, it's, some, it's about four light years away. The Alpha Centauri system is about four light years away. Um, the Voyager spacecraft it's going to take a few hundred years to. A few thousand years to get that far, I believe. So it's it's not within our technology currently. So yes, it's close if you can go light speed, but going light speed is difficult. It takes an infinite amount of energy to get there. So. Go ahead. I mean, you need to get more time. Well, no, I'm just thinking. <laughs> No, I mean, if, if it's, it's a great thing about going faster than the speed, well, as you approach the speed of light, is that time slows down for you, so you can live, I mean, you can hypothetically go across the galaxy for a long, long quite a bit of a galaxy if you were going at it really close to the speed of light, but there, there, are, there are technology issues between here and there. So. Okay. Do you have any data on um, the kind of uh, light frequency shifts that would indicate an atmosphere? Um, I didn't see a lot. Of that. No, it's it, they're very subtle. And, I mean, detecting the exoplanets is a very small signal to start with, and I don't have specifics on that. It's my I. I've not seen, I mean, the scientific papers I've seen, it's, it's very, a very small and subtle effect. Um, and I've not, I've not, I've not looked for that elucidation in, in a specific paper yet. So I mean, and it's something that I'm sure if somebody's going to claim that, you know, a planet has a, um, an ocean atmosphere, they'd, they'd have to uh, put it in the data. So if you wanted to, Go look for that. Go to Kepler 186F and do a uh, search on that for the scientific paper. And that, I mean, you should be able to find it. Find it in there. So, but uh, yeah. Anyway, there's lots of resources out. Yeah. Do you can they? What kind of backyard equipment do you need to watch Tabby's stuff? To something, do something like that? Um. To get meaningful data that they could use. Uh, something you know, Ken Hose's setup, that's or my, or my setup would do that. I don't, I don't know exa exactly where it is, but I mean, you can sit there and you know, given the, um, given that, yeah, it's it's doable. Now the problem is, is around here, is that doing that consistently, 
night over night after night. I mean, that's what they're after. Is they're after continuous monitoring, and you know, you get a series of amateur astronomers to do it. You have to normalize the data, so people's individual equipment, norm, the the characteristics of people's individual equipment normalizes out. But you know, it's doable with a with an amateur with a a scope. Um, probably about twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment. So. Do you want a number on it? Or, I, I mean, you can always. The great thing about amateur astronomy is that, like any good hobby, it will take as much money as you're willing to throw at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, given our weather, your backyard home system, do you get much data? I. Um, I'm not on the web. I'm not on the web here. I've got. Um, if you go to BP. Um, astro.org and you look under Steve's photos you'll see pictures you'll see some of the pictures I've taken so I've got probably a hundred pictures of, of different different stuff that I've taken out there they're pretty pictures not scientific data right. but, but enough that you yeah I mean I get I get nice colors and, and take pictures and stuff mm -hmm. like that so I, it's what I do I've been doing it for a long time So, um, my exoplanet shirt. Does anybody recognize what it really is? Mickey Mouse. It's Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> go, to, go to Tomorrowland, you'll find them for sale. <laughs> so. All right. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Everybody, thanks for coming, and Steve, thanks for doing this. Sure thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.